afternoon, everyone. You still have some seats here in the front for those of you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Shar Reed, and I am Secretary of the Board of Trustees and Chief of Staff to the President, and I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon. I'd first like to recognize a, a few special guests. Uh, we do have from the Board uh, Trustee Steve Kalecki. Steve, could you send it away? And also uh, one of our student trustees, Brady Roofer. Brady, thank you. And, and we also have uh, Senator Tom Sawyer. Could you? Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, this annual event is really an important Kent State tradition. Uh, when we get to have the opportunity to have the president really talk to us about where we've been, where we're going, um, and particularly what we're going to be up to for the next 12 months. Um, so it's always a good, a good occasion. I would like to uh, first introduce our next speaker, who will be introducing the president. And this was a tradition that we started last year and really felt uh, that we wanted to continue. Uh, Kevin Papp is an international relations uh, major, a senior, and is the executive director of undergraduate student government. Um, Kevin has been very active in his time on campus. He's a proud member of his uh, Delta Ta Delta fraternity, and he's also a cadet in the Air Force ROTC program here at Kent State. And when he graduates in May, he will be uh, commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Air Force. So. If you think I'm making him sound something like an Eagle Scout, he's also that too. Uh, but he, he's a great student, a great representative of Kent State, and we're so happy to work in partnership with him and all of our students. So, Kevin. Well, thank you, Dr. Reed. Members of the board, cabinet, uh, faculty, staff, students, members of the City of Kent, and our elected officials, Senator Sawyer. Uh, but I'd like to also extend my welcome to all of you as we really come together today as a community to both celebrate the past and recognize the present, and most importantly, look forward to Kent State's future. As I sat down to collect my thoughts and, and put together some remarks of how I could accurately and, and justly introduce to all of you President Lepton, it just happened to coincide also with an essay I had to write about my experience here at Kent State and what it's meant to me. And while my primary, if not sole, purpose in being up here this afternoon is to introduce our president, I thought I would begin by sharing just some of my thoughts on that with you. Recently, my mother joined me on campus for lunch, and this was one of her first times being here since I was a freshman. And one of her first comments to me when she arrived here was how unbelievable the transformation was to the plaza. She cannot believe the change from only a few years ago. And indeed, as all of us here know in the room, the transformation has been amazing. Both Kent State and the city of Kent are in the midst of incredible change. It's an exciting time to be a student here. The energy is so overwhelming, whether it's in the classroom or at the stadium, or just on the daily walk through the esplanade. You can truly feel a renewed and an increased sense of pride and community across campus. Mingling amongst our incoming freshman class these past few weeks, they are truly excited to be here. And I think this shows the great testament to Dr. Lefton and the vision he's provided for all of us here. When I see him eating lunch in the hub or walking on campus, I know he feels this energy as well. You really can't escape it here. Now beginning his sixth year, the results of President Lefton's excellence agenda can be seen throughout campus in our entire university system. Dr. Lefton's pursuit for excellence, though, did not begin here at Kent State. A leader in the field of experimental psychology, Dr. Lefton has provided tremendous research in the area of visual attention and memory, and he is recognized internationally. But a service to the higher education industry, both in the classroom and administration, encompasses over 40 years and spans the University of South Carolina, 
George Washington University, and most recently serving as Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Tulane University. And throughout his career, he has remained a passionate and strong advocate for undergraduate education. An enthusiast of the arts, and I'm told an amateur photographer, Dr. Lefton's passions extend far beyond just his professional career. He is also a proud husband, father, and grandfather, having just now recently added to his family with the arrival of their newest grandson, Gideon, who is just, I believe, two weeks old, or just over two weeks old. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my distinct privilege to ask you to join me in welcoming our university president and leader, Dr. Lester Lefton. this address at the start of every academic year, it's a, and I think it's really a fitting time for, for putting a collegiate spin on that old nostalgic feeling of a fresh start with a new box of crayons, 42,000 crayons. It's a fitting time for reminding ourselves that work in the academy is work that really does matter. And of course, the start of the academic year is a fitting time for a reflection uh, and perhaps for projections as well. I've recently, as you know, completed five years as president of Penn State University, and it has been an extraordinary privilege. That milestone has compelled me uh, to spend more than my usual time in the intellectual stockroom assessing where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. In my inaugural address five years ago, I said that with resolve, with resolve to work together and to put excellence into action every day, I know that we can invent a future that is significant and celebrated. Today, there's no denying that we're doing just that. In fact, the achievements of Kent State have exceeded even my greatest expectations. More often than not, you have put excellence into action when no one was watching, when no reward or recognition hung in the balance, and when it probably meant extra work, extra time, and some extra strength Advil. I continue to be amazed, humbled, and inspired by your highly personal and wholehearted investments in Kent State's future. Our investors are faculty members whose teaching ignites and inspires, whose scholarship and creative endeavors improve and even save lives. Our investors are students who are modeling the change they want to see in the world. They are coaches and athletes who prove that academic excellence, athletic excellence, and personal integrity can and should be compatible. They are staff members who use their countless skills to turn our students into graduates, our campuses into show places, and our challenges into triumphs. They are administrators who keep this place safe, sound, and solvent. And they are alumni who derive satisfaction from helping new generations change their lives with a Kent State education. Penn State's commitment to excellence embraces the view that every individual and every job on campus is important. It requires each of us to focus on how we do our jobs, whatever they may be, whether you're a vice president or a payroll clerk, a professor or a plumber. If you're striving for excellence, thinking outside the box, and keeping your mind open, you are helping Kent State and its students succeed. I hope we're all coming to understand this truth. It's a key part of my job to keep Kent State looking forward and moving forward. I stressed this need to evolve, to innovate, and to reach in last year's State of the University Address. I explained that to make our second century as meaningful as our first, we not only must think in new ways, we must act in new ways. The brilliant composer Stephen Sondheim captured this thought in a song written for the musical Sunday in the Park with George. 
the song asserts, every moment makes a contribution. Having a vision is no solution. Everything depends on execution. Putting it together, that's what counts. Sondheim's song was, of course, about creating an artistic masterpiece. At Kent State, we're coming together, working together, and putting together an institutional masterpiece, a first-tier, nationally respected public research university that never forgets its regional roots. The center of Sondheim's Pulitzer Prize winning play is the best-known painting by George Seurat. The French painter is known for using tiny dots of color to create images. Our Kent State masterpiece is composed of countless points of pride. Together, they form a remarkable success story. Before I share my thoughts about the year ahead, let me review some of our most significant points of accomplishment. By any measure, it is an impressive and lengthy list, one that is made even more significant because it was compiled in about 60 months. These have set and continue to set records in student enrollment and student academic quality. We created Destination Kent State, an innovative orientation program. It gives admitted students a jump start on college as it leads them to enroll here. Once they do, our online graduation planning system allows them to explore academic majors and track their progress toward graduation. Of course, the chief reason students say yes to Kent State is the quality of our academic programs and the caliber of our, of our extraordinary faculty. Whether it's sharing the joy of learning, producing pioneering research, or helping recruit students, faculty members play key roles that deserve to be recognized. We've been strengthening our ties to the region's two-year colleges. This makes it easier for graduates to pursue a Kent State baccalaureate degree. We've made significant strides in building a diverse and inclusive environment. Many of you will recognize the message on the side of the library that says, you belong here from campus publications, and it's also in banners. Those words have become much more than a slogan. I think they are becoming an important part of our campus culture. You belong here. We provided students on all eight campuses with a range of 21st century facilities. Our newest facilities, the Robert S. Morrison Health and Science Building at Ashtabula, the Performing Arts Center at Tuscaroras, and the Roe Green Center, which unites our theater and dance programs for the first time under a one roof. We also completed major renovations on Oscar Ritchie Hall and Franklin Hall. Construction is underway now on a 44,000 square foot Kent State University Regional Academic Center in Twinsburg. We are in the process of reinventing the university library and the surrounding Richmond Plaza. If you've been in the library lately, you know how different it looks from merely a few months ago, let alone five years ago. In direct response to student requests, there's been a huge increase in study spaces, something that is even more important now that the library is open 24 hours a day. This is a major step toward making the library the center of campus intellectual activities as it well should be. We took another step last month with the opening of the Math Emporium on the second floor. This 13,000 square foot facility is a fully staffed computer lab where students find individualized help in mathematics. Two months after joining the Kent community, I made one of my first public appearances before the Kent Area Chamber of Commerce. I told those business leaders that Kent State must be part of a vibrant, forward-looking community. And I stated, among those who believe that Kent State should be home, we should be home to a first-class hotel and conference center. Five years later, an unprecedented level of cooperation between the university and the city is making that vision a reality. In another year or so, a hotel and conference center will be part of a $100 million downtown renaissance that includes new restaurants, shops, and offices, an extension of our campus esplanade that creates a true physical connection between the campus and downtown. And it will also include a multimodal transportation facility and garage made possible by a $20 million grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation. I want to honor and thank members of the Kent State University Foundation, its chair, Kathy Hemming, and Vice Presidents Gene Finn and Greg Floyd for their tireless work in bringing these long-held dreams to life. 
We learned a great deal about Kent State's economic impact in an independent study I commissioned two years ago. It found that every year, Kent State and its graduates generate $1.96 billion in added income to the Northeast Ohio economy. Taxpayers see a real return of $1.80 for every dollar in their annual investment in Kent State. And the study concluded that Kent State is Northeast Ohio's leading public research university. In the last five years, we've built a variety of global bridges, bridges that provide valuable academic and cultural opportunities to students and faculty, and experiences that will help them compete and cooperate in a global society. We established, we established two offices in China, in Beijing and Chengdu, and one in Delhi, India. We've signed academic agreements with Saudi Arabia's largest university and seven leading Chinese universities. And we've continued positive relationships with universities in Turkey, Japan, and Russia. One of the many positive outcomes of these efforts is a significant increase in the number of our international students on our campuses. That number has tripled in the last five years. Our motivation for growing the ranks of international students is far more than financial. These students enrich our classrooms by sharing their perspectives and enrich our communities by sharing their cultures. Kent State celebrated its centennial with style and substance. As part of the celebration, we embarked on a $250 million fundraising campaign to fund student scholarships and a range of high priority needs. I'm thrilled to report that the campaign goal was met this month. But the priorities to be supported by the campaign dollars student scholarships topping the list are going to remain critical long after the campaign officially ends on June 30th, 2012. So Vice President Gene Finn and his hardworking team will spend every waking minute until then working with me to boost the campaign total. As we mark 100 years of progress, we also commemorated the 40th anniversary of the events of May 4th, 1970. We succeeded in having the May 4th site added to the National Register of Historic Places, dedicated a May 4th walking tour, and launched a fundraising effort for a multimedia May 4th Visitor Center. The highlight reel of the last five years includes a prestigious first for Kent State Athletics. We won the Reese Cup for the top Mid-American Conference men's athletic program and the Jacoby Cup for the athletic programs for women in the same year. And at the same time, we received the Max Cartwright Award, a newly established award for excellence in academic, athletic, for academics, athletics, and citizenship. Efforts from building pride to improving health and wellness have led to national recognition of Kent State's work environment. We've been selected by the Chronicle of Higher Education as one of the great colleges to work for two times. And the Employers Research Council has recognized the university four times in its annual rankings of the 99 great workplaces for top talent in Northeastern Ohio. We made campus sustainability a priority. This is reflected in the hiring of our first sustainability manager and the development of a strategic master plan for energy conservation. Many discoveries originating at Kent State have proved their vast commercial potential. A shining example is Kent Displays, Inc. Our commitment to innovation led us to create Centennial Research Park in 2007. It houses companies such as anchor tenant Alpha Micron, the first in the world to market flexible liquid crystal devices. As these companies develop products and technologies for the future, they provide research, internships, and employment opportunities for our students and graduates. The academic side of university life has undergone a number of important and beneficial changes in the last five years. We launched several major initiatives to modernize the curriculum and streamline the path to graduation for undergraduates, all with a focus on learning. We launched a College of Public Health. Our decision to put the creation of the college on the fast track was a big, bold, and ultimately the right one at the right time. Penn State's college is the only one in Northeast Ohio, the second in Ohio, and one of only 40 nationwide. Penn State launched an accelerated Bachelor of Science in Nursing 
and Master of Science in Nursing program. It allows qualified majors to complete their undergraduate degrees and continue to a master's degree on a fast timetable. We looked into our curricular crystal ball and saw that Penn State could help fill an exploding need for experts in computer-related fields. In response, we created an interdisciplinary school of digital sciences that is unique in Ohio and, in fact, nationally. It breaks new ground by bringing together faculty from more than a dozen different disciplines. We created a range of other programs as well that help students as they help Ohio and our nation. Take our decision to create two associate degree programs at Astabula that prepare students for jobs in Ohio's wine and grape industry. Each is the first of its kind in Ohio, which is one of the nation's top 10 wine producing states with an economic impact of more than $580 million annually. The Carnegie Foundation ranked Penn State among the nation's top 76 colleges and universities in the area of community engagement. We extended this focus on learning through engagement with a new requirement that all undergraduates engage in at least one focused learning experiential activity. Because Penn State is home to Ohio's first and only accredited aviation program, it was not surprising that the FAA turned to us to offer Ohio's only degree program in air traffic control. And because technology allowed us to view the world as our pool of potential students, we have been intent on expanding distance learning options from online courses to online degree programs. Last spring, one out of every four Penn State students took at least one online course. During the summer that just ended, it was nearly one in two. Major changes were made to the university's promotion and tenure policies. They now more closely reflect national norms. Achievements like these are among the reasons that Kent State is enjoying a new level of recognition and respect on the national and international stages. As evidence, this, this year as last, we are the region's only public university to place in the first tier of the best national universities in U.S. News and World Report's best college list. Kent State's graduation rate is the highest among public universities in Northeast Ohio. So we were pleased, but not surprised, when an independent analysis showed that the number of Kent State graduates far surpassed the number predicted based upon the overall preparedness of new students. This show earned us a high ranking on the most recent list of best performing national universities. In fact, 14th among 197 national universities and 189 liberal arts colleges. And there's more good news. Last year, Times Higher Education of London ranked us among the top 200 universities in the world. We are the only public research university in Northeast Ohio on that list. Let me put it another way. You are part of one of the top 200 universities on the planet. I've just reviewed a wide range of reasons that every member of our community and every Ohioan can be enormously proud of Kent State University. Our achievements and the priorities they reflect are the results of meticulous, inclusive, forward-thinking, strategic planning. As many of you know, every division of the university has articulated specific actions with specific measures in support of the university's overarching strategic goals. These divisional maps were aggregated into a single, concise strategy map. If you're not familiar with the strategy map, I encourage you to take a look online. R reminding ourselves of the size and scope of our achievements during the last five years is a worthwhile endeavor, but it really doesn't tell the full story. Part of my responsibility is scanning the higher education horizon for signs about the short-term and the long-term future and analyzing how they are likely to affect Kent State. There are signs in the current environment that are unmistakable and quite frankly, rather ominous. The question they elicit, the questions they elicit weigh heavily on my mind these days. I want to share them with you because they affect my thinking about Kent State and because I invite you to ponder them with me. First, I question whether as a nation we are promoting the acquisition of occupational skills over the acquisition of learning. 
The state of America's economy has made job creation America's most pressing priority. I worry that this, is, this focus is overshadowing an equally urgent need, the need for citizens who are educated beyond the specialized jobs, the specialized skills of a specific moment in time. Our nation and our society as a whole will always need the kind of educated citizens Kent State seeks to produce, those who can think creatively and critically, who can communicate and lead effectively, who can see, grasp, and act on the big picture, and who are motivated by community service as well as financial security. Our concern about jobs must include the concern about where the next generation of writers, historians, policy and the social activists, activists and artists, where will they come from? My second question that I ask you to ponder with me is, have we abandoned higher education as a public good and made it an individual private privilege? I refer to the dramatic decline in state support for public higher education. This is a national issue not just because institutional budgets are being slashed, but also because college access and affordability as principles of our democracy have been significantly diminished. Most of us know about the calamity in California, a state noted for a great educational system with many choices. Two years ago, cuts in higher education funding forced California's public universities to raise tuition by more than 30%. This year, California students continue to face double-digit increases. Higher education in Ohio is not in a crisis mode, I'm pleased to report. But many Ohioans, but many in Ohio, in the higher education community, really remember, and some of you are, are part of that community, remember when state funding accounted for about 75% of a university's budget. Fast forward 2011, that figure plummets to 18%. In response, Kent State has been diligent in developing new revenue streams while cutting and conserving costs. As we've done so, public universities have been burdened with a growing list of unfunded state and federal mandates. These mandates force us to draw on funds that could be used to support scholarships and other academic priorities. Though our success in raising private funds helps us, we are and are helping to cushion the latest economic blows, most Americans understand that an investment in a college degree yields lifetime benefits. But I worry that the ability to make this life-changing investment becomes more and more difficult for many students and their families. And I worry that this is happening at a time when our nation, when our nation's need for educated minds has never been more urgent. A third question is whether a nation, a great nation, can compete globally if its greatest asset, human capital, is underdeveloped. Let me share a quote that gets to the heart of this concern. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might as well have viewed it as an act of war. James Harvey wrote those words in a landmark report about America's education system called The Nation at Risk. They ring as true today as they did when the report was written in 1983. That's a tragedy. One reflected in the shocking number, the shocking number of high school students who graduate academically underprepared for college. Of students who took the ACT admissions and placement exam last year, and there were more than 1.6 million of them, just 24% met all of the test's college readiness benchmarks. From China to Israel, a growing number of nations are investing in their educational systems, and they're doing so to agree that it's leaving America in the academic dust. I worry that we will remain a nation at risk. And make no mistake, what we are risking is the ability of our children and grandchildren to enjoy the quality of life that we have observed, as well as the ability of our nation to compete and prosper in a global environment. Fourth and last, I ask, where will our next 
great inventions, innovations, and discoveries come from if our nation has lost the resolve for education in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. If we want the American dream to endure and thrive, we need a culture that values these STEM disciplines. Unfortunately, evidence of that is hard to see among the general public, and is often hard to detect across the education continuum. The fact that America is not producing enough college graduates is troubling enough, but more of them do not graduate in the STEM fields, and if they don't, we will soon be without the scientists and engineers to meet our nation's needs. In turn, we will hold an even lower place on the list of industrialized nations. I'm proud to report that Kent State is part of the solution. I will tell you about an exciting initiative to support women in STEM fields in a few minutes. Yet I worry that our nation will not act swift, swiftly and strongly enough to address its inability to produce STEM graduates. Despite my concerns, concerns I know many of you share, I remain optimistic about America's future. I'm especially optimistic about Kent State's future. How could I be anything less after spending five years in such a spirited and inspiring community? After five years of seeing excellence become an individual habit and an institutional hallmark? After five years of witnessing remarkable achievements across our unique eight campus system? Very few days have gone by during the last five years in which someone did not stop me to share their experiences as a member of the Kent State community. So many of these exchanges ended with the same comment. Coming to Kent State turned out to be one of the best decisions I ever made. I second that emotion. I've asked a great deal of our community in these last five years. I have pressed for new processes and new mindsets. I've encouraged small changes and major transformations. Most important, I've asked every member of our community to make excellence a conscious choice every day. Demonstrating the spirit of evolve, innovate, and reach, we have made tremendous progress, but the strategic goals we formulated together require us to reach further. So now that I've looked back, I want to ask every member of our university community to join me in to committing to four priorities in the year ahead and beyond. The first item I want to discuss is one you have heard me stress many times before. But now, more than ever, Penn State must improve student persistence to timely graduation. We have written a stunning success story when it comes to enrolling students. We must achieve equal success in helping students re reach the academic finish line. An important part of doing so is will be increasing the number of academically motivated and prepared students we admit. But there are many other pieces of the persistence, retention, graduation puzzle, from a lack of friends to a lack of funds. We must and will address all of them. In recent years, about 72 to 78 percent of our first year students have achieved sophomore status. This is a respectable rate that took significant effort to achieve. But it's now time that we move into a new retention rate neighborhood. To state the obvious, we can't help students who are not here. Improved retention means greater odds that our students will become graduates, citizens who are better able to contribute to their families, their communities, and in many cases, to their alma mater. A strong graduation rate literally changes lives. Two years ago, I stood here and asked for a university-wide commitment to customer service, which is an important piece of the retention puzzle. I dubbed it uh, the year of yes. As I noted earlier, faculty and staff on every campus answered my call, and you continue to answer today. For example, Dave Garcia, our associate VP for enrollment, led staff members in a major process to identify and remove roadblocks in the enrollment and registration process. The result, a more sensible and streamlined process, is a resounding success. Best of all, improvements are continuing. That, of course, is what the excellence agenda is all about. Because retention and graduation affect the future of our students, our state, and our society, I ask, may I dare say declare, that the next 12 months 
we really focus on retention. We will begin by developing a more deliberate and comprehensive retention strategy. Namely, we must create an institutional philosophy specifically about student persistence and first-year retention. We have to rethink our practices, policies, structures, and resource allocations to support student retention. The good news is that we have an alphabet soup of individual pieces. We have DKS, GPS, RCM. We now need to integrate them into a comprehensive retention graduation roadmap. We must deliver intentional learning experiences in and out of the classroom that align with our commitment to student persistence to timely graduation. We have seen much progress here, including the creation of the Kent Core, experiential learning opportunities, study away and abroad programs, and diversity and inclusion initiatives. Again, these are important developments, and they must be part of a persistence, retention, timely graduation roadmap. We have to optimize faculty engagement and mentoring of students. We always need to be aware that one size does not fit all when we talk about our students. They are complex individuals with unique needs and unique backgrounds. Last but certainly not least, we must ensure that all of our students receive consistent and personalized advising. Some of you have participated in a Kaizen event through your department or division. Kaizen is a Japanese term that roughly translated means take apart and put back together again in a better way. Perhaps we need a university-wide Kaizen event to assess current retention plans and develop a graduation roadmap for the next five years. I know I can expect great things from the divisions that work most closely with retention and related issues, but this priority requires the involvement of every university unit and every member of our community. In fact, each of us already helps students answer the question, do I want to come back here next year? If you're a custodian or a grounds crew member, you affect that answer by making our campus environments more attractive. If you're an academic advisor, you affect that answer by taking extra time to ensure that students are progressing as they should academically. And if you are a faculty member, you absolutely affect that answer by sharing your passion for your discipline and by being intentional in the time you invest in helping your students, especially those who are struggling. In short, Every time we show we care about our work, every time we put excellence into action, we have an impact on retention. In the last five years, our research enterprise has had its ups and downs in terms of funding. The great news is that Kent State faculty members across the disciplines have never stopped generating world-class scholarship and artistic creations. We all take enormous pride in the pioneering work of renowned faculty members like biological anthropologist Dr. Owen Lovejoy. He continues to put Kent State on the map through his involvement in discoveries that have changed our understanding of human evolution. Important knowledge, art, and innovations are being produced by our faculty members in many other fields. The commitment to research excellence that abounds among this faculty its proven capacity to produce path-breaking work. We have no doubt that we are moving in the right direction when it comes to research and creative activity, and that we're doing so with considerable momentum. Because research excellence is a defining characteristic of the world's best universities, we must maximize this momentum. Although there are more than a few faculty members who are hitting their ideas and discoveries out of the, out of the park, we really haven't found our institutional sweet spot for research and creative activity. If you follow or play tennis or golf or baseball, you know that sometimes a slight change in your grip or your stance can lead to dramatic improvements. Although her page tells me that no matter what I do, I can't seem to get a good golf game. <laughs> I'm optimistic that some small improvements in our approach to research will yield an optimum balance of path-breaking work and record-breaking funding. Having said that, I know that even small changes will probably mean significant work for all involved in our research enterprise. It's the way of the academic world in 2011. We have a new vice president for research to help us realize our research aspirations, Dr. Grant McGimsey. 
I'd like to think that his first name is a good omen for the future. <laughs> Dr. McGimsey has been charged with developing a strategic plan for research that will be ready for review in January. The plan will be designed to take Penn State's research enterprise to the next level of productivity and achievement. This clearly includes increasing the number of grant submissions to federal funding agencies. It includes hiring in areas with clear opportunities to excel in research and to attract federal funding. For the record, and let me be very clear, this doesn't mean that we will focus solely on high-profile areas like liquid crystals. We want to encourage and reward outstanding scholarship in the arts and humanities as much as in the sciences. As I've said many times in the last five years, Kent State's success is a community success. But it's an indisputable fact that no university can achieve greatness without superb teachers and scholars. So I've continued to think about what the university might do to facilitate faculty growth and support, and so as to support faculty as they pursue their careers. I have a modest proposal that may pique faculty interest. It addresses the enormous workload required of tenure-track faculty in their pre-tenure years. After being hired, tenure-track faculty must prove their academic merit and productivity through teaching, research, and a, and a range of service to their departments and colleges. It's a rigorous academic marathon that at most institutions spans six years, but is essentially done in five years. I want to affirm my strong and unwavering support for the practice of tenure, and let me note that I'm proud of the tenure reforms that Kent State has enacted in the last five years. Today, I ask the Faculty Senate and other appropriate bodies to consider a change that I believe might benefit both individual faculty members and the university. What if we gave new tenure track faculty the opportunity to choose one of two tenure timelines upon completing their first year with us? the traditional six-year track, or a track that keeps the tenure clock ticking for perhaps up to 10 years. Those who choose the extended tenure timeline would have more time to secure grants in a fiercely competitive funding environment, more time to write publication caliber articles, chapters, and books, more time to document their progress, more time to contribute to unit needs from recruiting students to committee service, more time to participate in the larger community, and more time to devote to family responsibilities. I worry that too many faculty, the kind of talented scholars we want on our campuses, for many, five years is just not enough time to achieve their professional and personal goals. The in increased flexibility I'm proposing would not be a change unique to Kent State. A number of universities have enacted longer tenure timelines. And a recent study by the Association of American Medical Colleges found that the number of medical colleges with lengthened probationary periods for faculty doubled in the last 25 years. I've already touched on the next priority that merits a place on our radar screens. It centers on encouraging and supporting education and research in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, especially by women faculty and students and more specifically by women faculty and students who are African American, Latino, Asian American, and Native American. Although women constitute the majority of our student body, and they do, they are underrepresented in the STEM fields. The same is true nationwide. Although America has an urgent need for professionals in the STEM fields, women are underrepresented to a very large degree. Now, there's a complex web of social, psychological, and economic reasons for this, and I'm not going to go into them. But a number of Kent State's strategic goals compel us to support the education of and research by women and minorities in STEM fields. They include our goals of ensuring student success, creating an inclusive environment, helping our region and state and nation remain competitive and secure. Of course, removing gender barriers to education, professional opportunities, and career advances, advancement is simply the right thing to do. 
Penn State is already moving in the right direction. In fact, we're committed to helping bring about positive change, transformational change in the culture and climate for women and underrepresented groups in the sciences. For example, a half million dollar NSF grant is providing scholarships for broadening participation in the sciences. And Kent State is proudly partnering with Case Western Reserve University and four other public research universities on the NSF-funded IDEAL project, Institutions Developing Excellence in Academic Leadership. This innovative collaboration is encouraging the career advancement of women and underrepresented minorities in sciences and technology. Penn State's ideal team comprises outstanding faculty members from the departments of mathematics, chemistry, biological sciences, physics, psychology, geology, geography, and our College of Applied Engineering, Sustainability, and Technology. The team is breaking new ground with a three-year agenda that includes a partnership with the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as the Provost Office. We hope to piggyback on the IDEAL project with additional grants. But with or without new funding, Penn State is committed to increasing support for students and faculty in the STEM fields. Toward this goal, Vice President Alfreda Brown and I met with faculty and students who are active in the IDEAL project. Our discussion led me to ask Dr. Brown to form an ad hoc task force the task force will recommend actions to promote the participation and success of underrepresented groups at all levels of STEM education and research. I ask that these recommendations take advantage of the university's many existing resources and that they be in my hands early this semester. And we intend to translate as many of the task force recommendations into action as quickly as possible. I intend to keep the university community informed of our progress. If you have ideas, about how to close the gap in STEM education and research. I know that Dr. Brown and the task force will welcome them. International programs. International programs were a Kent State strength long before global education and experiences became an essential element of a well-rounded education. But we must evolve to keep pace with the demands of a global economy. We must send more students to our programs in Florence, Geneva, and many other major centers of knowledge and culture. We have to continue to welcome students from all corners of the world, and where possible, we must fulfill our teaching, research, and service missions within a global context. Just last week, I began a conversation with our Board of Trustees about the role of global education in Kent State's Excellence Agenda about ways to optimize the superb programs, services, and initiatives already in place, about the investments we must continue to make in global education, and about the global aspirations that make sense for our institution. This conversation is going to, not going to be confined to the boardroom table. Developing the best roadmap for global education at Kent State requires broad consultation across all of our campuses with faculty and staff. I've therefore asked the Provost and the Executive Director of our Office of Global Education, Dr. Marianne Saunders, to consult with faculty groups about how we can evolve, innovate, and reach new heights in global education. The ultimate goal is to produce a comprehensive, long-term strategic plan for global education, one that quite literally offers a world of options and opportunities for our students, faculty, and in our and our entire community. Let me conclude my remarks today with a reference to one of our best known symbols of Kent State, the majestic golden eagle. As I've noted on many occasions, I cannot imagine a more fitting symbol of who we are today and how we are approaching our future. Eagles are masters at soaring, a skill I have seen countless members are, of our community attempt and adopt since I landed at Kent. I appreciate and applaud the determination, daring, and dedication behind each flight. I don't take for granted the strong and steady winds beneath my own wings, my incredible wife Linda, our growing family, and the faculty, students, staff, and alumni who are the Kent State family to which we all belong. From reaching out to the world, to partnering in a downtown renaissance, from creating groundbreaking programs to breaking ground on world-class facilities. 
and from helping faculty on every step of their career paths to helping students navigate the path to graduation, the Kent State family is achieving excellence every day. I honor each of you and every one of you for your contributions to such a wonderful success story. I thank you for your energy, for your passion, for your time, your talent, your treasure. I would have not thought it possible that I could be more excited about the future than I was five years ago. But standing here today, I know that the most interesting and inspirational chapters in Kent State's history are ahead of us, and we will write many, many of them together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lefton, for uh, giving us all a lot to think about and certainly a lot of work to do uh, this year, but great work that has great results for our students and our communities. Uh, now I'd like to just again thank all of you for coming and note that there will be a reception upstairs in um, room 204 and we will be, in addition to our fellowship, um, recognizing and welcoming our uh, new newcomers, uh, Dr. Grant McGimsey, who was mentioned as our Vice President for Research, and uh, Dr. Sonia Alemanio, who's not a newcomer but has uh, recently uh, become Dean of the College of Public Health. So. Thank you, and please uh, join everyone upstairs if your schedule permits.